Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and it is the 25th of November, 2012. Welcome to the Future of Education. My guest today is Kieran Bersetti. How are you, Kieran? I'm doing great. Thank you, Steve. Really nice to have you here. I know that this is taking time away from a busy schedule. You start school tomorrow? Sorry? Do you start school tomorrow? Yes, I do. I do. So uh, a lot of people have probably seen your YouTube video, the TED video. Um, for, for those uh, who have, I'm sure they're going to enjoy exploring a little bit further. For those who haven't, can you give me a sense of um, your particular vision of children and childhood? <clears throat> Actually, um, the vision is is actually very simple. It just is um, an approach um, to equipping our children with the ability to first be aware of the world around them, to have the skills to shape the world and better. So I think it's really about making them less helpless and more competent every single day. You certainly I think are. This is the I can bug which we infect our children with. Right. So. It's, I'm interested in comparing Indian culture to U.S. culture, in particular, maybe um, Western culture. Is that an appropriate way to say it? Do you consider non-Indian culture, say, American and European culture, Western culture? Would you say that? Yeah, that's typically how it is uh, sort of uh, understood. Okay, so in Western culture, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, testing and high-stakes testing in a way that often seems to prescribe or deny choice to the student or their own ability to be proactive. Do you experience the same thing in India? Yes, uh, in fact, probably more than what you would think of as high-stake testing in, uh, in the U.S. or in, in the European context. Uh, here, the entire uh, approach for the last 60 years has been purely on uh, a rote memorization, academic uh, testing of uh, real memory rather than any intellectual sort of um, stimulation. So that's typically been uh, the approach simply because of the numbers. I mean, the sheer numbers are what works against us. We've got, like I keep saying, 300 million children that need to go to school. So uh, the emphasis really is not so much on understanding as, as much as just um, studying and therefore achieving a certain um, academic grade to allow you to probably take a job and that's really been the uh, sort of focus f uh, over the last so many years. It's just, I mean over the last maybe 10 years when quality started becoming a dialogue in the conversation of education. Till now it was just access to education. So. I would say that uh, unlike the system in the West where you'll believe choice is not part of your um, uh, sort of vocabulary, but it still is far more than what our children are given. So here in the United States, and again, this, the generalizations are hard, but there are obviously schools or pockets of innovation where um, learning is viewed differently, but it's not the primary narrative. Do you find the same thing in India, that what you're doing is recognized by some small number of people who participate and the larger narrative remains unchanged? Or do you feel that you're moving the needle in some way? Uh, no, no, no. It's not moving significantly enough at all. So uh, though, like I said, the pockets are emerging, they're just so few and far between that it's going to take several years to be able to see some amount of tipping point. So I would say that uh, uh, innovation here is is a rare idea, it's, but it is definitely being recognized as something that is important. And uh, but I but again I say numbers. Numbers is what we are going with. So you say in in your material that um, doing good can lead to doing well, that your students are achieving it at good academic levels. Um, as well as um, seeing school and learning in this particular way. Do the parents of your students feel fully supportive or are you having to convince them as you go along as well? 
Well, I really had the luxury of starting a school where I was not pressed for time. So I took it a year at a time. So it's taken me 12 years to reach my 12th grade. Um, so it's been a gradual story, but and therefore the parents um, have, have were part of this this journey. So initially, the resistance, if it was ever there, was right at the beginning, the first couple of years when uh, they didn't quite know what I was setting out to do. But I think uh, the results have also spoken. The kids have have made their learning so visible that I I must share with you that now uh, my parents don't buy what what is traditionally called a progress report card. You know, because the kids have uh, constantly make their learning so visible um, that they have become partners in this. So now when ch uh, parents choose to come to Riverside, they know what we're offering. Um, so there is no kind of um, sort of um, conflict in that. A lot of cultures see a change sort of a rite of passage to adulthood in early teens. Um, you seem to be really focused on helping children become involved in activities, become proactive and, and fuller part participants in society um, as, a, as a part of their becoming adults, right, that throughout school. But you start them much earlier than, say, early teens, right? You're giving yes, younger yes. children much more of a chance to participate. How, what kinds of things do you do? Oh, lots. Uh, in fact, um, at, at Riverside, it starts, like I said, uh, uh, from the moment they reach uh, age eight. And that's really when the very first uh, concept of the other is understood by the child. And that then becomes their stories. Uh, so uh, every year, starting from uh, that age, uh, and let's say that grade, every year they engage uh, with uh, society. They engage with causes that uh, they perceive. So it could be hunger, it could be the differently abled, it could be child rights, it could be um, the city, I mean, in terms of environment. Um, so five years, that is from grades three, four, five, six, seven, an engagement happens every year. So that when they reach the, the teen years, that is uh, the whole ethical milestone starts uh, that's on 13, they have five years of experience of having known uh, that there are issues beyond just a school. And so now they can't say they don't care, because now that they are aware, they just have to care. And they come 13, and that last leg, that's 8th, 9th, 10th, and 12th, they, they do shift from engagement to persistence. Uh, the children choose um, an area that they are concerned with, and they have to stay with it for five years. To recognize that change takes time, it's not easy, and there will be issues that will come in the way, but how do they stay uh, committed to the idea? So that's really the journey at Riverside. It is awareness, engagement, and persistence. And uh, so several of the issues that our children are connected with are often around education. It's around children stricken with cancer. It is to do with, uh, like I said, making the city child friendly. Uh, so um, that's really what these stories become. So you're not only working with the students and with their parents, but you also need to work with the city. So yes. tell us a little bit about how you've worked with the city to create an environment that would be friendly to this. <laughs> well, a lot of begging and, and shameless kind of, uh, you know, stalking was part of that story. Um, I, in 2007, actually, when uh, I recognized that the city uh, the city is mostly, at least in India, not designed keeping this youngest protagonist as as the center. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I, through the years when the kids uh, were with me, we, we used to take them a lot for, you know, street plays and, you know, things to do with the city. And often the response was, you know, Oof, children should be, you know, kept inside or children should be quiet and children should not be heard and not be seen, <laughs> you know. so. Um, and that really was something that compelled me to say, how do you, how, how does a city not nurture its child? How, how can a city not design for childhood? And uh, we do have in my city that I come from, of course, and, and considering I come from the land of Gandhi, I mean, you know, it's just shocking that we don't have safer cities. Uh, and also in my city, we have uh, Asia's foremost design and management colleges. And I'm a graduate from the design college. And I remember thinking to myself that uh, the city should have been a landscape for the wonderful design uh, consciousness that my college should have done and the, or the, the management institute should have kind of created remarkable stories of change. 
but it hadn't we hadn't seen that so this really became a, a conversation with all the stakeholders right from the municipal corporation to the police to the to the institute saying that how can we all collaborate as to create a safer space so that children will then feed back to the city if we feel, if they feel that the city is giving to them and uh, that became uh, the con- the story and uh, some of the the uh, projects that sort of emerged was with collaborative a collective kind of you know the collective action from the municipal corporation from the police from the citizens of the city and uh, one of the most ambitious ones was of course to close down the busiest street for traffic and that like i said for for four years we we uh, i mean the riverside story kept pursuing this with the municipal uh, municipal corporation and the police and today i must say with a great amount of gratitude to the city the municipal corporation has chosen to close down that uh, particular street every sunday so it's become part of the ethos of the city um and our children can just recognize that uh, even if it's for um, a day every week the city cares and i think that's these are important messages we have to give our children do you think there's a connection between the kind of experiences your youth are having as as students and children and their ability to participate actively in governance and significant issues as adults i i think it's um i i would of course see it manifest maybe in a couple of years but what i have started recognizing what the what i see my kids do i mean these over the years that they are are less scared and i think that's these are i mean their way of of uh, of addressing an issue seems to be a lot more ambitious and a lot more audacious than i've seen children otherwise i mean they if they have to uh, say oh we'll do this uh they don't seem to see the complexity of it first they see the possibility first and i think that's the biggest change that we have seen that not i i've seen a lot of i mean not just children adults kind of first look at the complexity of a situation and say oh my god that can't happen and you know what if what if what if and even without starting we stop um what i'm seeing with my kids is they start with the possibility of a rather ambitious plan right from oh we'll speak to the prime minister or oh, we'll speak to you know ban ki moon you know i mean the, the kind of way they speak is kind of literally letting them believe that yes i mean what's the worst that can happen i mean there's no greater sort of um, action than to go out there and try it i, I see that happening i'm hoping they it will stay with them over the years when they when they leave but i think that could be a study after maybe a couple of years this is a tough question but do you think that the the traditional dependence and compliance that you're trying to help your students overcome is actually attractive to people who are in power or who are sort of running society do you think there's pushback on this kind of schooling because of the independence not not even i would not even say it as, as much as the people in power i think the biggest problem it uh, uh, our children face is from home because compliance is pretty right i mean it's so easy it it satisfies everybody everybody is safe everybody is happy everybody listens and 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 my my whole thing has been against compliance i'm saying at at full capacity every year 25 children will graduate from riverside because i'm a small school i i'm the whole strength is just 300 so it's 25 children to a grade and and 25 will graduate every year damned if i'm going to make 25 compliant there's no way so uh so the biggest uh, right of passage actually what starts happening is when our children start the questioning and uh parents start kind of uh, uh coming to us and saying oh, he's asking why he's saying give me an answer and you know, so there's a reluctance admiration to the idea even the parents i can sense it that they they i mean they will not tell me as much as they will tell others at you know dinner conversations you know my my child is so independent my child has such a great mind uh but there is it's an in, it, it's an important shift from the mind to say that respect is about just uh, uh compliance because that's a very indian uh, uh sort of uh, upbringing that the elders know better and therefore you should just um, keep quiet and respect so in my head respect is not necessarily uh, about being compliant respect is about you know offering an idea that could probably uh, change things for the better so and that 
uh, uh, faith that our children should have in that sense uh, is what um, I'm hoping, of course, to be able to present it in a way that doesn't necessarily, um, is not necessarily combative. That we keep telling our kids that, you know, if you want your idea to even uh, uh, stick, then you have to understand how to present it. So it's not about being rebellious unnecessarily. It's, you know, so uh, it's been great. Well, so in many ways, you're modeling that very set of attributes. Right? You're doing something unique. You're doing it in a thoughtful way. But you are pushing forward, um, oftentimes um, maybe feeling like you're the only one, but committed to your path. Um, how do you find teachers who <laughs> feel the same way? Well, uh, I'm actually very blessed with having uh, uh, the team that joined me right off in 2001 uh, is it's, it's still with me. right? And I think as a group of people, like again, I said, I had again the huge luxury of not uh, rushing this journey. And I think so that, I, and I believe that all of this has uh, has allowed uh, the richer, to be deeper, uh, to be more mindful. The teachers who came in, our, I, there was not a rush of numbers. Uh, it was a year at a time, so we kept, you know, uh, inviting a couple of people every year to join. Of course, now we're a, we're 60 strong, but uh, it grew. It grew slowly, and it grew with with uh, with thought, and it grew with investment, deep deep amount of investment. And now I've got a tremendous, uh, uh, you know, second line also that um, that takes care of uh, the training and and I think the culture has been built over time. It has not been fast forwarded. It has not been rushed. And uh, so when uh, and I think in some deep, deep, uh, you know, you know, corner of or core of all of our beings, we want to we want to leave a legacy. We want to do what's right. We want to be part of you know, excellence and an ethical practice. And when we see that happening in a space, uh, it does good things to us. And I think we just lend our voices to that and just make it richer. So I've, I've really, and I think it's not about uh, uh, forcing it upon to the team at all. They've just become huge partners and believers uh, while seeing the value of the practice. And now when they add their own value, uh, it's, it gives great amounts of self-respect to oneself. And I think uh, it's, 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 it's doing great things to all of us. But you also talk about the parallels between teachers and students, and you can't have student learning without teacher learning. Those, those are my Absolutely. words. I don't know if they're yours. But you, you <laughs> yeah. commit a significant amount of time to the teacher's learning, right? Yes, yes. In fact, it's around 50 days more than the academic year for kids. So if, uh, we, we work around 210 days uh, roughly every year for the children and 260 days for the, for the team. So that's, like I keep saying, like exactly what you said, you can't have high quality student learning without high quality adult learning. So we do a lot of investment in the adult learning. It's ongoing. It's, it's over the weekends. It's when children leave for the vacations. It's when they, before they come back. Uh, so it's 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 very intense. Yet it's really around the teacher well-being also, you know, getting them to love the place, um, be excited, uh, look forward to thinking and ideas, and uh, and I think when they've seen themselves grow, and now like I said, when the school has been recognized globally, when people we constantly have visitors on campus to watch our practice, uh, they, well they're watching they auditing my, my teacher's work and it feels fantastic for all of them to say, wow, you know, we're being looked on as a beacon. What do you do during those 50 days? Does it follow the same awareness, engagement, commitment pattern? Uh, actually, it, it, uh, we work around what the five investments we call. We w work around how do we continue to ensure that uh, our physical, cognitive, social, emotional and spiritual um, constructs are imbibed not only with us, but also how does it pan out and how does it um, kind of translate and get realized in our practice every day. So we will have inspirational talks. We will, it'll be a combination of inspirational talks. It'll be a combination of, like I said, reading and mastery. Uh, it'll be a combination of physical play. It'll be a combination of master classes. It'll be a combination of, you know, getting uh, a visit done, you know, to see great practice. So it's, it's kind of like a multi-layered um, thing. We've in fact just finished five days of professional development before our term starts. 
and it it, uh, it was just great you know and we we did a little pottery session you know just to bond as a team again so it's it depends again on the current need but what feeds us through is inspiration passion and growth so do your teachers explore their own interests as a part of that oh a lot of it uh, in fact it's kind of mandatory we want to get the passion into the school in fact a lot of the the uh, the teaching happens through passion so we have in each key stage we have the ch teachers teach through passion if it's in the in the older grades it, it works it uh, we have something called spark plugs where every teacher's core passion is 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 given time so uh, the teacher can pitch uh, their class to the students and the students sign up if they think it's exciting enough. So we've had, uh, you know, blood, guts and glory happening in the lab, which a teacher of mine was hugely interested in dissections and, you know, stuff, getting the innards out. So one big uh, thing was happening there. Then there was another teacher who talked about film and, and lyrics. There was another spark plug happening there. So we had, had another spark plug on the Olympics because that was happening. So basically, if I have a passion, do I? Uh, how do I bring it forth? So getting our kids to say, you know, that my teachers are not just people who make us learn, but they're, they're great learners and passionate people themselves. So it comes in. So let me explore a dilemma we have here in the U.S which is there's an increasing worry that teachers will have inappropriate contact with students outside of school. So mm. often the kind of modeling of passionate interests um, is um, invisible because there's mm. a, an inability for, for, or there's a concern that students would connect with the teachers and so the teachers have to be careful about not um, um, being too public in their activities outside of school. Have you had to deal with that at all? And are your teachers modeling sort of a political participation or behavior that you ever wonder, well, how does this impact our students? Actually, that's uh, interestingly, um, except for when Facebook started, you know, uh, and that, that became a space for, because uh, now everything's visible, right? So for my teachers having a party uh, in the, uh, confines of our home, uh, suddenly if those photographs are posted on the net, uh, well, kids will start seeing a lot of that, right? So that was something that we, we spoke about as a team, about what uh, and how do we want to create that space, the social networking space. And um, it's when, uh, it's so far we've not really had huge uh, to worry, but I think I know that some of the teachers uh, do uh, keep uh, in touch with the kids because a lot of assignments sometimes we post, you know, on the net. We have Skype uh, uh, sort of uh, sessions yeah, sometimes in the evening. Um, so social network space uh, needs um, is is where the interaction pro probably happens the most outside. Otherwise, what we've made as a policy that we would not um, sort of go for uh, parties and, and things uh, or birthdays of children simply because one of the key things is that if you can't do it for all, then don't do it for just one. So what we have uh, tried to do, in fact, a lot of is because Riverside has a lovely campus. And uh, we've encouraged actually children to, if they wanted to have a night over or something, have it actually at Riverside because it's a very safe space. And the kids will be safe, we know, and there'll be adults here. So, and it'll be on a safe uh, ground. Uh, so we've tended to kind of look at uh, the public um, space more on more neutral uh, grounds and probably uh, uh, limit um, the Facebook interaction to just, uh, uh, you know, simple comments and assignments. Uh, that's really where the extent to what our uh, thing is uh, happens over there. So the school becomes a real community yes. Yes, yes but it is a private school right it is it is it is, it is. and so um, how do you sort of personally feel about the the need to be I'm assuming you're charging parents for the students to come yeah so yeah, yeah. how do you how do you feel about spreading this knowing that not everybody's going to be able to afford the kind of experience that you have well, we've actually done three things. Um, two years ago, we started what was called uh, what, uh, what is the right to education. So we uh, just keeping in mind that f the fact that not everybody will be able to afford um, the school. We've, we've been right in the beginning, of course, we always used to give what we call financial assistance 
to kind of uh, allow uh, allow participation from different you know communities to come in and different um, uh, uh, sections of society to come in. But two years ago, we actually started what is called the right to education, where 25% of our entry points is completely free. These are for uh, children who can't afford education at all. In fact, it's people who fall under what they call the poverty line. So we started that two years ago, and we're very happy to see the wonderful um, sort of engagement and inclusiveness that the school has been able to um, uh, participate in, because we were able to, in terms of bandwidth also, just two years ago, say, yeah, we wanted to have a, a little mini India reflected in at Riverside itself. So that's one leg we've started. But we also, uh, in fact, approach, uh, which was that citywide initiative is completely open source and free. And I don't know if you're familiar with the third initiative, which is Design for Change, which is um, an idea of taking design thinking uh, to uh, all children. So that is today in around 60 countries, uh, reaching over 25 million children. That again, uh, we started Riverside in 2009, and today is, like I said, an open source idea, reaching that same principle of design thinking <clears throat> has now reached um, 1,000 schools just in India itself, but rest of the world also. And this year, that is 2013, we are working on what we're calling the e-platform, uh, putting Riverside open source. So we've been documenting Riverside for the last seven years in documenting our practice. And we just saw probably little glimpses of that um, uh, on TED, but we have documented student learning, um, great, great, great best practices and models of learning for the last, like I said, seven years. And, and we believe today, because of the 10 years behind us, we now uh, are able to have that credibility, not only in the market, but in the practice to say that this works. And we now believe that this has to be made public. Though we've already got um, seven other schools implementing the Riverside program, but this now will go uh, as an open source e-platform. That I believe, like I keep saying, is our responsibility in education, that you know, if you're doing good practice, it has to go out. So I'm not keen on more opening up more Riversides, but I definitely feel that the impact of Riverside has to go beyond. So the idea here is that you open source how you manage the school. Is that what you're? Is that what you would provide? No, I, I'm 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 providing uh, the learning approach, the approach to learning. So videos of practice. How how does learning take place? How can you energize learning? How can you put this like I said, this I can uh, bug, and how how does that look like? So it's it's literally it could be units of study, it could be the professional development program, it could be the processes that we do. So we've documented the length and breadth of Riverside, and that now is is in you know tiny little uh, wonderful videos that you can actually just uh, and with the video will come the whole back end. How if so for instance if I have to teach a particular thing like mastery what we do at Riverside with the older kids. I mean, there'll be a video that will show teachers how that gets done. There will be the whole process of how it gets planned out and, you know, the evidence of student work. So a teacher says, wow, I mean, I can do this in my school, sitting all the way maybe in, in the U.S. or Brazil. Okay, so let's talk about design for change and your own design background. What does that actually mean? What does um, design thinking mean? You know, design thinking in its purest form is the intentional act of making an experience better for all concerned. It's the intentional act. It's not a by chance, by fluke concept. So the design thinking works on, uh, I mean, what we've done is we've kind of uh, demystified it because it always used to have this rather elitist vocabulary attached to design thinking. You know, you had to do this several things and the uh, design thinking process seemed to be like only certain people's domain. Um, what we've we've kind of simplified it into a simple four step: feel, imagine, do, and share. And um, this, uh, if if you um, we're telling we're telling children specifically, of course, children, but this we've also used with adults that you cannot solve a problem if you don't know what the problem is. And typically, what's been happening in education and rest of the all other domains of human endeavor that we solve the wrong problems because we are in such a rush to find a solution that we often don't pause long enough to figure out what the real issue is. And then we solve the problem, we wonder why change doesn't happen. And that's been the, uh, the story specifically in education. We've never gone back to the stakeholder, that is a student, and said, how do you want to learn? We've just given them more books, probably with colored photographs, and said, see, we've now put uh, lovely illustrations in it. Now you must love it. 
we've not really gone back to them to say how, what is it how do you want to learn how do you want to um uh, for us to you know be part uh, partaking in your life so design thinking the very first step of feel is that is is to engage is is to first observe and then to engage with the people concerned and uh, once you do that you're able to look at human patterns and then imagine a way to make it better so you look at like a bold idea or a quickest impact or an idea that has um, um, or, or is replicable in nature and then you go out and action it the do and in the sharing is now we recognize the most powerful construct of design thinking the sharing allows good practice to uh, be made visible therefore accessible and so somebody else can say hey i can do that too so design thinking today is um, of course being recognized in all fields where people are saying wow this is really what we need to be looking at but more so in education and today with design for change when children are applying the pause first because that's what education doesn't allow us we say we have only 200 days we have to you know finish all these syllabus we have to finish the content we have no time for prototyping and uh, one of the key again elements of design thinking is prototyping how do you refine an idea and in the refinement uh, comes the real understanding so we we've just kind of offer this um, as a, a story in uh, we offer this in 2009 and we made it like i said we had launched it just in india with with over 30000 schools and like of course when the ted uh, uh, when i shared it on ted then it kind of went viral and went to uh, went around the world but it, what we're recognizing again is that children all over the world have never been asked what they feel we've always been telling children what to do so for the first time when we're asking children what they feel we're really coming out with the stories that really bother them so they're not bothered about global warming at all most the one thing that is affecting most children around the world is bullying our kids are scared in school and that's something nobody's addressing i i want to go there but for a second i want to return back to the design piece so that process uh, the pause and the intentional act of making something yeah. better does does that is that actually explicit in the design program that you were in when i think of design i'm thinking of graphics product. and yeah. <laughs> kind of thing or or yeah or or product design was yeah. that a part of your schooling that process mine yeah i was i had i uh, my uh, my major was in in visual communication and that of course was the whole graphic design piece uh, but very early on i remember when i started my own practice in 91 92 um i started recognizing that there is no real great uh, line between good design you can't say this is product and this is um, graphics and this is this thing so uh, i got into i think what was more an experiential design space where um i would i would constantly wonder how does the customer or the user gain from that experience rather than just take from the experience it's a very different approach you know you you can take something and you can gain from it and for me it was always a question of how do you gain from the experience so even in the work i'd done in my when i ran my studio it was it was really about figuring how does a customer interact with that space the design the product the graphics which, whatever it could be and uh, the whole um, intention was will they take away from it and is that what the desired uh, impact was so design thinking is a very optimistic way to look at life you know it's always attempting to make uh, an experience better for the user what had happened in because people just got caught up with the product and you're saying okay is the product so great we must throw it down your throat um and design thinking is actually saying no when you when you're prototyping whatever that action is whether it's a product or a graphics you're understanding the user better you're not asking him to buy your product and those those shifts and we started looking at it was really important and that i i did a lot of that with river sun i still do that go back to the kids to say does it make sense to you tell me why is it not making sense so tell me what this can we do to better make it better so much of of river sun has been built on a, a collaborative piece with the kids so they've kind of co-constructed um in the processes and the narratives at riverside with me and and i think that's what gives me such great hope about when you just put go back to the to the child uh, from them you will you you will be taught so have there been other significant influences in your thinking about education have you read any of the kind of classic educational thinkers or are there particular voices that you have really been drawn to Yes, my big hero, uh, Howard Gardner. <laughs> uh, 
I, I remember reading him in 2001 and being completely smitten <laughs> by, by the complete clarity and lucidity with which he would present an idea. And, I, and I, he, he's been a huge, huge influence in the way I have looked at the work I've done. Uh, another, uh, another space, of course, but a person specifically was Car Carla Rinaldi of the Reggio Emilia approach. I had the good fortune of having heard her once when I'd gone for my Reggio experience uh, in 2007 and again recognizing, wow, how simple we are in, in most places and in education, all other fields, everybody wants to make everything so complex to make them sound so important. And here were people telling you, my God, it's, it's, it's actually so simple. And that has, has always uh, fascinated me. Of course, Gandhi has been, for me, a very, very important influence. No, I... Um, I wish I felt like I was more of a scholar on Gandhi, but I'm not. <laughs> but I certainly see in the desire for you to to implement change on a broad scale, what I would have said was kind of a Gandhi-like um, desire. Oh. Um, what in what other ways do you feel that you're that you would emulate uh, the kinds of things that he did? Oh, I, I don't know about emulating as much as, as recognizing. I mean, there have been times over the last 10 years when even through, say, Design for Change or Approach, one would get confronted by, by you know, stubborn minds or, you know, reluctant minds. And you can you kind of say, oh, if, why is it so difficult for people, you know, to see the sense? And I would just always, I think, when there was this moment when one would just want to give up to say, man, this, this guy, we waited for... 40 years to get independence. When he came to India, it was 1910, and he got independence in 1947. For 30 years, he just didn't give up. I, what the hell am I cribbing about six months, you know, one year or two years, you know? So I think more it has always been this, this idea to, to um, look at today and to ensure that today goes as, as ethically as possible, as true to intent and action as possible. For me, those have been, that, that's what's probably inspired me more. Can I have my action follow my intention? And can my intention, uh, you know, stay true to the child? Does he also serve as a model of someone with a fairly regular background who, through persistence and simplicity, enacted change? You know, uh, he is such uh, uh, a huge part of, I think, every Indian story, at least uh, um, for us, my generation probably is the last one who probably still recognizes his influence on, on, on all of us. And I think for me, my, my attempt, at least at Riverside, is, is to help continue that. So I, Gandhi is a very big influence at Riverside. In fact, all my kids at Riverside are... Um, no history. I mean, are part of his story, you know, and a lot of it becomes from him. It's pulled from him. This is, uh, there's, in fact, when we just celebrated the first Be the Change conference, I, I must share that last year we uh, designed for change is attempting to reimagine Gandhiji's birthday. That's October October second is Be the Change Day. Till now, nobody ever celebrated his day as Be the Change Day. We used to just take a holiday on his birthday. You know, that was so fun. I'm saying, my God, how can we do that? So this year, uh, we, we had the first Be the Change conference on, on his birthday, which is to celebrate all the stories of Design for Change, to show how children are being the change. So I think that's, in one way, the legacy I'd like to, to hold on to about him and his stories and his influence and get our children to, to understand that we, a lot of us are here today simply because of this man. And though now it might seem to be critical or to, you know, sound very, oh, what about Gandhi? I think it's silly. We have to just rem remember that a man such as him ever walked the earth. So again, I feel embarrassed not to know more about Gandhi. I know what most people know, of course. But uh, it would seem that there is a connection between sort of the simplicity of the man and the his non-traditional background. I mean, he wasn't a politician, right? I mean, he uh, was he a lawyer? Yeah, he was, was a, a lawyer. lawyer. Actually, right. yeah, he was a lawyer. Right, but but also sort of an uncelebrated person who then kind of through a vision makes a huge difference for people. Uh, y you did not train as an educator, right? I mean, no, no. Right? 
So, so is there a l sort of a larger lesson for us about how we live our lives that, that Gandhi reflects and that you're trying to reflect in the school of a, of a willingness to kind of reach beyond what we might perceive as our normal boundaries and, and make change? Uh, if, if, if I ever started out with that, um, you know, I, it's just like I, I started out because of my son and the experience he had. And I just, uh, at that point, I remember being perturbed enough to say that I can do a better job, you know, and I didn't know what that better job was. I just felt that I could. But I, I keep thinking so many of us go through life unperturbed. Okay, I mean, and, and unfortunately, blessedness or any kind of um, the fact that we don't have to work too hard makes us even less perturbed about about the world around us. And I th and I and I think uh, and because uh, Gandhi himself came from a very affluent family. Uh, okay, and he needn't be perturbed. You know, he, sh he he went to the best college. He was at a good law practice. But I, I can't understand, I still am unable to figure out what is it in certain mental constructs that make us perturbed and what is it that doesn't. And um, I'm hoping that with my kids, because of one, we do what is called the inspiration series every week, every week with our kids. And in fact, we have um, a story that, that they themselves will be part of. That's why persistence is such a strong idea and citizenship is such a strong idea because I want my kids to believe that they don't have to be rich or strong or powerful to make change happen. All they have to do is feel. And they, that means they have to stay perturbed. Um, and for me, um, as I, or from the schools, our responsibility is that for 15 years when they're with us, it's not just quadratic equation they're going to be perturbed about. You know, they have to understand about democracy and freedom and inequity and all of these and know that they have um, a, a, a hand to play to make it better. So I think for me, just keeping them perturbed is an important story. So I had uh, Kirsten Olsen on the show a couple of weeks ago. She wrote a book uh, called Wounded by School, uh, where she had sort of discovered that even people who did learning as a profession didn't, f didn't come out of school feeling like they were good learners. Mm -hmm. um, there's a film by Carol Black called uh, Schooling the World, in which she looks specifically at schools in northern India and the, okay. the um, unintentional but negative consequences of Western-style schooling in a mm. particular set of villages. Um, do, are you familiar with the film? Do you know no, that, no, no, that particular no, film? No. Um, well, she looked at the degree to which children coming from the village would, would go to the Western-style school, and then in order to progress would have to move to the city to go to sort of the next Correct. level. And then it was very difficult for them either personally or culturally to go back to the village after they had been sure. educated and that there that only some small percentage of those in the city then actually moved on to the university or to go to another country for schooling so a large number of them were left in the city maybe arguably more poor than they had been in the village mm -hmm. I know that's an oversimplification of her film but is is that something that you have thought about in terms of just the the notion that school could actually be a negative for people regular schooling? Yeah, I, I, I think in many ways um, it does. I mean, I'm not just talking about from village to city and, and that uh, movement. It is just, in for, in, uh, I think for us, we've never even thought of what schooling has to be. Again, we've not had the luxury in India to think that schooling actually has to be about quality. It's just about passing time, getting a degree, getting a job. So India has not really talked to us because it's such a scarcity model. That's all we've been telling our kids, that there's so little out there. So whatever you do is not good enough. And therefore, so much of the negative starts happening right from school. We're tell, telling our children that cheating is all right if you have to get ahead. Bribing a teacher is fine if the you know child gets its marks. And those become acceptable norms because of the scarcity model. So we've not had an abundant story. We've not had a story that says, you know, if you're capable, if you're smart, if you're passionate, you can actually go out and realize that passion because there will be space in life for that. I mean, I remember when, when if, if God forbid you happen to be academically even slightly smart, which unfortunately I was, the only two avenues that were, you had to either become a doctor or an uh, engineer. Those were the only two preferred uh, socially acceptable jobs. 
And when I joined the design college, a lot of people, you know, in my family, uh, all my relatives, etc., uh, thought maybe I didn't do well in, in school and therefore we shunted off to this design college, which was the only design college that had started and nobody had, had a clue what design was. So only now, um, and, and again, so for so many years, society's acceptability of jobs determined what happened in education. So only uh, math or, or science became valued. Uh, and those were, those then became uh, what you what uh, uh, schooling would kind of thrust on your throat. So it was never, never about finding their voice. Never. And I don't think it still is that. And I'm hoping that we will slowly shift to a point when uh, children will find uh, their voices, you know, and find their passions and recognize that they can realize that dream. And so entrepreneurship was never um, a, an approach to education. It was all about a job. So uh, it's so today when when people go out and, and find so it, whether it's from a village or a city school, it was the same story. And only now it's probably changing a little. So let's kind of wrap up by having you tell us about the design for change. And you're discovering that this, this, this concern for the students, um, that for many of them, it's bullying. So yes. how, how does the design for change movement address that? And what kinds of things are you seeing kids do? Well, uh, we've got a lot of stories about bullying that, ha that are coming in and some of the solutions that our kids have been sending us have been quite remarkable. Uh, there was a school in, uh, uh, in, in the south of uh, India which, which looked at um, um, the idea of bullying in their own school and did a week-long um, sort of initiative that was very interesting. So the first thing was silent hour. That means they all taped their mouths for an entire hour of the, so everybody, right from the teachers to the pupils to the students, every single person put a tape over their mouth and experience what it meant for somebody not to talk to them. Okay, so that was one, uh, that was, uh, one initiative. Then the second day, they ensured that every day for lunch, they sat with different people uh, to make friends. So they, they refused to sit in their own cliques and in their own little groups, but ensured that every day for lunch for that entire week, they would sit with new people. Then they went ahead and one, uh, the third day was made little badges for every single person in the school said, I am special because, and then the kid filled up what they were special uh, uh, and they all wore it. So it became a great conversation piece that everybody was special. Uh, then the fourth day they made cards um, uh, for everyone and the fifth day they made this huge installation of like a huge mural with everybody's handprint on it. So they said that having done that, uh, a lot of uh, parents actually started coming to school saying that the children felt safe for coming uh, for that, uh, uh, after that particular initiative. And in fact, we met those children a year later and uh, we were really, really happy to see that they had actually continued uh, that, especially the lunch, sitting with different people at lunch and the, and, and the special, I am special because became one, uh, one event of uh, every week. So I think what the children are telling us is that when they experience it themselves, their solutions are far more layered than if an adult came and said, you know, you should do this. Because I think they're repeatedly telling us again that you don't quite know what we're feeling. You know, that so we're feeling this and, and we need to solve these for ourselves. So uh, I think what we are today now, it's been four years and I and we've got over 10,000 stories of change. We, we're the largest collectors of stories in the world. I mean, these are real stories of change. And what we're doing is we're coming up with, uh, for lack of any other better word, a kind of uh, a textbook because we recognize that most schools uh, because they just built to resist if it's not part of the curriculum. We, introduce, we would like to introduce design thinking as a subject in most schools. And we're creating this in collaboration with the Good, uh, Good Work Project at Harvard, with the D School Stanford, with NID and its, its designers. And we're putting together a design thinking book along with these real stories of change. So we've got the best comic book industry in India who's, who's converted uh, the stories into comic as the second of... Uh, December, we're launching this comic, which is which is stories of change, um, you know, so the superheroes. 
so what we're trying to do is that these stories that are coming to us, we want to put it back into publishing. So we, we, we're getting into storybooks, we're getting into animated videos, we're getting into uh, a textbook. We're kind of saying children should now be inspired by other children. So there's a nine-year-old in Bhutan or there's an 11 year old in Peru or there's an eight-year-old in the villages of India. I mean, they're changing the world. And uh, we didn't have role models. And so these kids can become role models and find the Gandhi in them or find the Nelson Mandela in them or find the Martin Luther King in them. That would be pretty special. <laughs> that's, a really, <laughs> that's a really good way to end. Um, was there anything I didn't ask you about that you would want to make sure people knew about what you're doing? No, I, I just love to know if more people would be interested to collaborate with us or get their ch schools to take part in Sign for Change. Um, I, I would just love it. And uh, so I'm just uh, an appeal to all your your listeners to say that we would love to hear your children's story. And you can be part of Design for Change and so that we could have the deep pleasure of sharing your children's stories. That would be fantastic. So thank okay. you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Steve. It was lovely.